Welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, today we're very fortunate to be joined by David Morrison, who's the director of the Carl Sagan Centre for Life in the Universe at the SETI Institute. Uh, Dave uh, did a PhD in astronomy at, uh, at Harvard, uh, and uh, his career has uh, focused, his early career focused on infrared observations of uh, outer planet satellites and asteroids. Uh, he uh, received NASA's Outstanding Leadership Award for uh, his work as the first program scientist on the Galileo mission uh, to Jupiter. And his uh, many positions in NASA have, have recently brought him uh, to uh, the NASA Astrobiology Institute, uh, where he was the senior scientist before he uh, became director of the NASA Lunar Science Institute uh, and uh, founding director of, uh, sorry, uh, he was director of the NLSI. Uh, and uh, then um, he has come across to the Carl Sagan Center in, uh, in uh, recent years after the NLSI work. Uh, Dave is a fellow of the uh, American, uh, the, the AAAS and, uh, and also the California Academy. Uh, he's written numerous college textbooks on, planetary astro on astronomy and planetary science and over 160 scientific publications. Uh, Dave is uh, well known for his work uh, exposing uh, 2012 uh, doomsday hoaxes, uh, and he has a site on the internet where you can uh, talk seriously about um, about the problems of those hoaxes on the internet. Uh, and Dave has also uh, received the NASA Outstanding Leadership Award for his work on mass extinction events such as uh, the KT impact event, uh, and he's been instrumental in setting up the NASA Space Guard uh, effort to assess the asteroid impact hazard. Uh, and uh, so he's, today he's going to talk about his work uh, here at the Carl Sagan Center and also the work of the scientists here, uh, particularly with regard to astrobiology science. So if you'll join me in welcoming Dave. Thank you, Adrian. Welcome, everyone. Is the, uh, the volume okay? Good. Uh, I see we're honored to have Carl Filcher, the director of the NASA Astrobiology Institute, will, who I hope will correct me if I make any serious errors. I'm happy to have members of our board of trustees, lots of people here. Uh, I am not going to be talking about my own research. I'm going to be talking about the field of astrobiology. And I think I'm able to do that as one of its founders and one of the people that, uh, that worked very hard in the 90s in particular uh, to create the field of astrobiology to help set up the NASA Astrobiology Institute. And then went on as director of, as Adrian said, as director of the, um, the NASA Lunar Science Institute to try to take the lessons that had been learned about how to do a virtual research institute and rebuild that same concept in another field. So I am going to be talking about four things, basically. First, a little bit about the history of what astrobiology is and how it came about. Then a review of the astrobiology roadmap, the NASA roadmap, that essentially defines what astrobiology is today. A few examples from many that I could have picked of research currently being done in astrobiology here at the SETI Institute. And finally, a brief overview of the most recent effort, which has been to prepare a proposal in astrobiology uh, for potential membership as a team in the NASA Astrobiology Institute. In a sense, astrobiology began here in the SETI Institute. The Institute was founded more than 25 years ago to support research that was related to the Drake Equation. And I'm sure everyone here knows what the Drake Equation is. But I want to remind you just the range in topics that are embraced 
in trying to understand and estimate the probabilities of intelligent communicating life in the galaxy. Uh, these are the terms. Uh, again, just to remind you of what most of you know, it starts with a rate in stars per year. That could be the rate of star formation in our galaxy. It ends with a duration in years. So if you multiply a rate by a duration, you will get number. And all the rest of the terms are non-dimensional. They are all fractions or numbers that you multiply to get some estimate of total probability at the end as the product of these factors. So the first, as I said, is the rate of star formation. Then the fraction of those stars that have or will develop planetary systems. The average number of stars in a system that are habitable. That's a fraction too, really. It's just a fraction that has the possibility of being greater than unity. Um, the fraction of the habitable planets that do develop life. The fraction of the living worlds that develop intelligent life the fraction of those that develop communication technology that we could detect, and then finally the duration of that communicating period, which could be terminated either by some tragic end of the, of the civilization involved, or perhaps more likely because they decided they neither wanted nor wished to continue to broadcast their presence into space. So those are the defining fields for the SETI Institute. Astrobiology had a somewhat independent origin, but it's actually very similar to what those founding, those founding science topics were. The name was proposed by NASA in the mid-1990s, <coughs> excuse me, in recognition of the increasing importance of life sciences. Dan Golden, who was the NASA administrator at that time, really got off on a kick about biology. He was telling everybody in the agency that they should take a biology course. He was suggesting they all buy a biology textbook and study it. And that was, I think, a, a realistic understanding that if the 21st century may be the century of biology. The other point is <coughs> that NASA was making discoveries and carrying out investigations that might allow the space program to help answer some of the most fundamental questions about life. Where did we come from? Are we alone? Where are we going? So we started from those discoveries, those things that seemed to indicate that it was time to merge biology and space sciences. In the mid-90s, the first exoplanets were discovered, the first planets beyond our solar system. The Galileo spacecraft had just confirmed the existence of a global ocean of liquid water on Europa, which has a greater volume than all the oceans of Earth put together. There was a lot of work going on dealing with complex organic chemistry in interstellar space and meteorites. The Human Genome Project was just ramping up, and people were beginning to realize the power of genomics research and how that could help us in the detection of life beyond Earth. The International Space Station was beginning construction, and there was a lot of hope then that the space station would serve as a platform for important biological studies. Some of that has happened, but I think far less than, than many people hoped. There was a series of planned exploration missions to Mars centered around the idea of follow the water. That is, we were beginning to focus our studies of Mars on its potential past or present to support life. And most important, historically, there had just been an announcement of evidence for fossil microbes in the famous Mars rock, ALH 84001. And that really was a high-profile event. Um, it went to the White House. Al Gore got excited about it. President Clinton made a, an announcement of it. It was considered a true breakthrough, and it did a lot to stimulate the science of astrobiology. The consensus today is that that evidence is not persuasive, and that probably those are not fossil microbes. 
but it sure got a lot of people thinking and had a very positive effect on our field. Well, we have three names that have been in use, and I think it's important to, to try to clarify the differences, even though they're pretty fuzzy. There's exobiology, astrobiology, and bioastronomy. All have been in use simultaneously, and they mean almost the same thing. First note that the words are constructed so that the most important word is the second one. At least that's the way I think you interpret the English language. So exobiology is a study of bio biology beyond the Earth. Astrobiology is a study of biology in the universe. Bioastronomy is the astronomy that's related to biology. Not surprisingly, bioastronomy is a term favored by many astronomers. And there is a bioastronomy commission in the International Astronomical Union. <coughs> Exobiology, while the word goes back quite a long way, had really come into its own in NASA at the time of the Viking missions to Mars. And it is focused on the understanding of and search for life beyond the Earth. Astrobiology attempts to be a little broader. We are going to include the Earth. We are going to study life in the universe wherever it is. And in practical terms, the only life we've discovered yet is on Earth. So most astrobiology is concerned with understanding life on our planet, its origin and evolution, and the habitability of strange and extreme locales on our planet. In practice, Many Europeans have continued to use exobiology with an identical meaning to astrobiology. So I'm not going to worry about those differences, but people always ask, what is the difference between astrobiology and exobiology and bioastronomy? How does one define the contents of a new field? Well, the way NASA does it is they make a roadmap. When I first heard that term, I really didn't understand what it meant. To me, a roadmap is some direction from going to point A to point B. But it's used much more generally here. It is a whole network of interconnected possibilities. But that's the term NASA uses. And since uh, a lot of effort was put in over many years to defining this roadmap, it becomes the de facto definition of astrobiology, at least in NASA and the United States. I organized and chaired the first astrobiology roadmap conference way back in the mid-90s. Um, and we didn't quite know what we were doing, but more than 100 potential astrobiologists came to NASA Ames. And we spent two and a half days discussing what the contents of this field would be. And we had a whole lot of, uh, of more or less detailed problems of interest. It hadn't quite gelled until the very last day, in nearly the last session, one of the attendees, Mike Muma from Goddard Space Flight Center, said, look, let's make this simple. There are really just three things we want to know. Where did we come from? How did life start? Are we alone? What's its distribution? And where are we going? And those with a little wordsmithing became the three important central questions of astrobiology. Where did we come from? Are we alone? And where are, you going? where are we going? Now, the roadmap has gone through several iterations since. And this is the most recent 1997 version. And these are view graphs that I got from David Damaray, who was the chair of that uh, road mapping panel. So we start with these three fundamental questions. How does life begin and evolve? And notice we're not saying, how did it begin and evolve on Earth? It's much more general. How does it begin and evolve, wherever? Does life exist elsewhere in the universe? And what's the future of life on Earth and beyond? I will confess, I still like, where did we come from? Are we alone? And where are we going? And that was very nearly the terminology that was on the first presentation I made to Dan Golden, who was 
the NASA administrator and had to decide on whether this was a worthy thing for NASA to embrace. He said, no, that doesn't sound scientific enough, doesn't sound technical enough. You have to rephrase it. And so we did, and this is what it came up with, which is perhaps better, but there's room for, for both formulations. So the roadmap starts with those three fundamental questions and then sets out seven goals and a lot of other details. There are dozens and dozens of pages of examples and potential investigations. The first goal is to understand the nature and distribution of habitable environments in the universe. Not to search for life itself, but to understand habitability and the environments in which it might exist. So that involves modeling, the formation, evolution of habitable planets, which of course means that you have to understand what you mean by habitable, which is not a simple question. And then making observations directly, astronomical observations of extrasolar planets to try to merge what we know about other planets and planetary systems with our idea of what constitutes planetary habitability. The the green stripe on this graph, I'm sure everyone has seen, the habitable zone. Lately, that term has been replaced in the popular press with Goldilocks zone. That is, not too hot and not too cold, but just right. And it's defined primarily for a planet by the presence of liquid water on its surface. Follow the water is so much the goal to understand the distribution of life as we know it. Why do we focus on life as we know it? Mostly because we don't know how to recognize life as we don't know it. It's a little bit analogous to the old issue of looking for your lost keys under the street light. You look there because you could not see them anywhere else. They may not be there. They may be somewhere else, but you start with what you know and can do. And so when we talk about the habitable zone, we talk about planetary surfaces where there's liquid water. Now initially it was thought that you could just understand that in terms of distance from the star and the temperature of the star. But I think everyone has become aware that planetary atmospheres play a huge role. For instance, if we did not have a carbon dioxide atmosphere on Earth, our planet wouldn't be in the habitable zone, it would be frozen solid. It's the greenhouse effect that raises our average temperature high enough to have liquid water. So it really isn't as simple as just a green Goldilocks zone, but that's where you start. The second goal is to determine any past or present habitable environments, prebiotic chemistry, signs of life elsewhere in our solar system. In other words, the exploration of the planets in our own solar system to understand potential habitability and search for the presence of life. Well, the lead candidate has always been, and I think still is, Mars. One could argue whether Mars today is within the habitable zone, since it's a frozen world. But the evidence, as you all know from the surface of Mars, is that liquid water has flowed there in the past perhaps even in the very recent past. And once again, we get into this issue of distance from the star versus the effects of an atmosphere. If Mars had a bigger atmosphere with a larger greenhouse effect, the surface would be warmer. So the search for habitable environments and evidence of life on Mars is, and I think will continue for a long time, to be the single main focus of the search for life beyond the solar system. But it's not the only place to go. Excuse me. The search for life beyond Earth within our solar system. But it's not the only place. The outer planets offer some wonderfully interesting possibilities. Um, Europa, I have mentioned, with its global ocean of liquid water. Titan, with its extraordinary Earth-like similarities in a very strange context which is very cold and has no possibility of liquid water. 
but has all sorts of other interesting organic chemistry happening. Maybe other places, satellites of Saturn, we don't really know, but we are tempted when we look at the outer solar system to broaden our definition of habitability and not just stick with liquid water because there are such fascinating worlds there that aren't, strictly speaking, places where terrestrial type life could exist. Follow the water became the mantra for Mars exploration for more than a decade just because of our interest in habitability. Many people don't realize that we have not done a life detection investigation on Mars since Viking. It's all about the environment and habitability, and we aren't even sure when we will do actual life detection. The, uh, the mission en route to Mars, the Mars Science Lab, comes close. But only in Viking did we take this audacious step of saying, we're going to build an experiment, we're going to take a scoop of Mars, we're going to subject it to certain conditions and see if it contains living microorganisms. Interestingly, although the consensus among scientists is that that was, search was negative, there are still people who argue that at least one of those life detection experiments had positive results. And this now becomes an interesting philosophical issue. You had four experiments highly relevant to life. Three chemical wet lab type experiments and one a uh, mass spectrometer to study compositions. Three of the four said no, no life. One of them said maybe yes. Scientists look at the consensus of all those and say that the weight of evidence is strongly that there was no life detected. But it's still room for argument. And of course, the Viking experiments were, were primitive, very primitive by contemporary standards. So when will we try it again? I don't know. Now, in addition to follow the water, another major focus in looking for life on Mars or elsewhere is follow the energy. You not only need liquid water, but you need something that will drive metabolism if you expect life to prosper. And so following the energy and following the, uh, the water actually go together. Goal three, understand how life emerges from cosmic and planetary precursors. That, in effect, is where did we come from. And it has become a field a very great complexity in the context of modern biology. And there are lots of potential experiments, most of which are actually way beyond my head, of how life might actually form. I think it's interesting to realize that for all of the excellent research that's been done, there is no scientific consensus of how life began. Once you have reproducing molecules or cells or whatever they were, the evolutionary process can kick in and we can at least understand in principle how we got from that origin to the complexity of the natural world around us. But evolution tells you nothing about how that first reproducing genome or virus or whatever it was came about. And so that's just a tough thing to do. It can be approached experimentally by complex computer uh, modeling and so on. But it remains one of the most interesting and difficult questions in science. How did it happen on Earth? Can it have happened elsewhere? And one reason that we want so much to find life beyond Earth <coughs> is that right now, there's only one known kind of life. N equals one. We are all related. Every one of us, everything, every microbe, we all seem to have come from the same common ancestor. We don't know what about life is contingent and what is necessary. 
we really, really need to go to n equals 2 and find some other independent origin of life in order to understand our own life and our own history on this planet. So we look for computer modeling, evidence from geology for the prebiotic environment on Earth. We study the role of organics from meteorites. We look at the formation of planetary systems, and then we try to model what the first cells might have been like. And it's very hard because there are really th three things that, that go together in what we think of as cellular life. You have to have a genome that can reproduce itself. You have to have a metabolic system that can extract energy from the environment. And you have to have a bubble around it, separate the inside from the outside. And how do you get all those at once, and if not, which one came first? I think it's a daunting but fascinating question. Goal four is to understand life on Earth and its environment and how life and the planet have co-evolved. Most of you know about the Gaia hypothesis, which suggests that life actually in many ways controls the environment on Earth to maximize the chances for life. It's not generally accepted, but it does represent the understanding that life and the environment co-evolve. It's not just the environment changes and life evolves to meet it. The two go together, and the only place we can study that, of course, is in the history of Earth. We don't have any life elsewhere to look at. So we study the Earth's early biosphere, how complex life, developed from simpler precursors, and how external events may have influenced it. Of course, dramatic geologic change, changes in the sun, it's gotten warmer, hotter, greater flux of energy on the Earth, um, cosmic radiation, evolution of the Earth-Moon system, nearby supernovae, Gamma ray bursts, all of these things from the outside that might have affected the Earth. And of course, my own personal favorite, which is the effect of the impacts of asteroids and comets, which we know in at least one case 65 million years ago was extremely important for the history of life on Earth. If there had not been a 10 to 15 kilometer diameter asteroid strike the Earth 65 million years ago, it seems quite possible that the planet would still be dominated by the dinosaurs, which were doing very well at that time. And we might be holding this meeting. We might be discussing this topic. The room would have to be much bigger. The chairs would have to be different design <laughs> because we might be intelligent dinosaurs. So this contingent event, which could not have been predicted or understood, which evolution could not have prepared for, reset the clock change the boundary conditions. And I think it's fascinating that while we normally think of evolution as proceeding through gradual change, competition between species, adaptation to changing environments in a slow way, when a truly catastrophic external event happens, whether it's a meteor impact or a gamma ray burst or whatever it might be, the game rules change. And it doesn't matter how fast you can run, or how smart you are, or what you can eat and can't eat. The things that determine survival in the face of a sudden catastrophe are different. But some things do survive, and that's why we're here. Um, when we look at the history of life on Earth, as I think you all know, it's a, most science is focused on this narrow wedge which is Paleozoic, old life, Mesozoic, middle life, Cenozoic, recent life, as though that's all there was. Well, when, when the 19th century geologists put this together, that's really what they thought of as the history of life on Earth. But we now know that, that life was here for three billion years before the first fossils. And one of the things that I like to emphasize is we kid ourselves if we call that primitive life. The 
microbes that we have today have undergone far longer evolutionary history than the metazoans. I mean, we, we ha they have had three to four billion years to sharpen their skills, to improve their, uh, their survivability. And they are not primitive. They are wonderfully complex and well adapted. And by the way, they greatly outnumber all of us, not just in number, but even in mass and in their effect on the, the geochemistry of our Earth. Don't knock the microbes. And remember how many each of you carry with you. You have more microbes, microbial cells in your body than the cells of your own body. I heard an estimate that we each have more than a kilogram of microbes in us, and we could not get along without them. Goal five is understand the evolutionary mechanisms and environmental limits of life, and a lot of that looks at extremophiles, life that exists under environmental conditions that we would have thought impossible, the cooling water of nuclear reactors, temperatures as high as 20 Kelvin above boiling, temperatures as low as 20 Kelvin below freezing, extreme acidity, extreme alkalinity, all kinds of strange things that greatly broaden our concept of habitability and broaden the potential that we see for life beyond the Earth. Understand the principles that will shape the future of life. That's the third of those goals. Where are we going? And this is very interesting, and I'll come back to it in talking about the astrobiology proposal, because we have rapid environmental change happening right now on Earth, from global warming, from all sorts of other effects, many of them caused by humans, that we can study. And we can look at the history of habitability on Mars, for instance, and maybe if we're smart, we can figure out where we're going. And finally, perhaps most interesting to many of us, how can we find out if we are alone? How can we find biosignatures, evidence of life elsewhere? And one place to start is in the solar system. It's implicit, it seems to me, in the way this is written, that they think there is not life flourishing elsewhere in the solar system, but that we can still find, say, chemical evidence of life that had once been there. So there are lots of biosignatures, and one of the best examples I mentioned at the beginning was that Mars rock, ALH84001, which seemed to have evidence of microbial life, fossil microbes that had been there for nearly four billion years, but turned out Probably not to. It's not simple to interpret what is a biosignature in our solar system. It's even harder when we go beyond the solar system and ask, could we recognize a living world? We now know of thousands of exoplanets. What would it take to look at those objects with telescopes with power enough to distinguish a living world from a dead world? Wonderfully interesting idea. Note that at the bottom here of 7.2, it includes evidence of technology. That is one of the first places in all this that SETI comes in. Unfortunately, when astrobiology was being put together as a concept within NASA, it was only three years after the, uh, the US Senate had declared SETI to be inappropriate for the federal government to support. And so everyone was a little shy about including that. But my goodness, what could be a clearer biosignature than to receive a radio transmission of artificial origin from another world? Here is a picture of many biosignatures. I wish it included a SETI signal as one of those. There are also operating principles that I actually wrote, when, so I'm very proud of them, in astrobiology. It's multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. It's an attempt to create a new discipline 
by combining elements of those that already exist, with all the challenges that implies in communications between scientists in different fields and with the public. And I'll give you one cool example. There are many young scientists going into astrobiology, and they realized, since they were in different departments, geology, astronomy, chemistry, uh, uh, genomics, and so genetics, and so forth, how were they going to figure out how to talk to each other? And they did something we could almost try. Um, when they gave talks to their peers, they gave everyone in the audience a square piece of paper and said, whenever the speaker used an acronym or a concept that was unfamiliar, you should raise. And so if only three or four people raise it, of course, the speaker ignores it and goes on. But if there's a whole sea of cards come up, it better be the time to stop and explain what you're talking about. Planetary stewardship is also very important. We are not talking about dead worlds, we're talking about living worlds. We do not want to contaminate another world like Mars that might have life by sending terrestrial organisms there that could obscure the evidence or even eat everything that was already there and take over. Um, and we don't want to have a danger of back contamination to Earth. And we have, many scientists think neither of those is likely. But we have to take it seriously. It's part of our societal obligation. Some people think we've screwed up our own planet. We'd sure better not screw up another one, too. Then there's the broad societal interest. And that part of it is contamination, but it's otherwise this is real serious stuff, folks. Finding life on another world would probably be the greatest scientific discovery, certainly for many generations, perhaps of all time. We don't know how people will respond. We don't know the effect on religion or philosophy. It would depend probably on what kind of life it is. Most people would not change their whole attitude based on microbes, but who knows? So we have to think about a broad stakeholder. And growing with that is an obligation to educate and explain. We don't want to be seen as, as secretively looking for little green men or covering up UFOs or whatever it may be. We need to be open and transparent to use the modern terminology and to communicate and educate and use astrobiology with its intrinsic public interest as a tool to uh, to educate people and to increase their understanding and appreciation of science generally. Now, what are we doing here? I, I picked a very few examples, partly because I have pretty pictures, but maybe they will give a little flavor. We have more than 50 scientists here who are working in the Carl Sagan Center, all of whom bring in all of their own funds by writing proposals. They are all living on the edge. I have great admiration for them. There's no guarantee of their salaries. Everything they do has to be of a quality that will allow external funding agencies to support them. Um, I'm also immensely impressed by some of our people as, as just explorers, heroes. And so I mentioned some of these. Life on ice in the Antarctic, an exploration of life undersea and other uh, of the ice-covered lakes in the dry valleys of the Antarctic. There is a typical SETI Institute scientist at work in the laboratory, <laughs> headed out for the Lake Untersea area. And this is what he found. This is one of Dale Anderson's pictures of an extraordinary life existing on the floor of one of these ice-covered lakes. Almost no, no energy gets through uh, from the sunlight. It's dark. To get there, you have to drill through 10 feet or more of ice and dive into that cold, dark, alien environment. And here's this cool stuff growing. You know, this is a thing sort of this big. This is micro it's made of microbes, but it's actually macroscopic and quite beautiful. And who would ever have thought it could be there? Here's another typical SETI Institute scientist. This is Natalie Cabrol. She likes to study lakes in the Andes at extraordinary altitude, 19,000 feet in this case. So you got to haul your 
scuba gear all the way up to the top, put it on, then go down in there. And again, the life forms are extraordinary. Here, the problem is not enough sunlight, but too much. There is a tremendous ultraviolet flux at 19,000 feet, much greater than here. And yet, she finds life there that gets along just fine. It doesn't even go deep to hide from it. It lives right near the surface. How does it do that? What are its repair mechanisms? You go to weird places and you find weird life and expand your understanding of the envelope within which life can exist. Another project in the Andes is to develop a technology for a lake lander that could ultimately go to Titan. Talk about planning ahead. It be, might be decades before we can do that. But Titan has lakes of hydrocarbons at tremendously low temperatures. And the idea is to develop a technology that could actually drop a lander that would float in one of those lakes and could study it directly. We are all so delighted to be awash in the exoplanetary data from the Kepler mission. And we have many connections here at the SETI Institute with the Kepler mission including the major responsibility of, I think it's 18 of our people are working in the processing, which is not just routine turn the crank processing, but understanding how to pull up signals in the midst of all the noise so that you can detect with confidence a transiting planet. If you want to think about what a transiting planet detection is like, I hope you will all take advantage of looking at the transit of Venus which takes place, I think it's June 5th, the last time in this century, so I don't think anyone here will live to see the next one, although who can say? <laughs> and when you look at a telescope, you will see Venus, which is absolutely a Earth-like sized planet. It's the same size as the Earth. We have a sun-like star. You will see an Earth-like planet transiting over a sun-like star. And the goal of Kepler is, in an unresolved, distant world, to see the drop in light. But guess what? When you look at the sun, you will also see a bunch of sunspots, just as big as Venus. Not every little black circle on the sun is a terrestrial planet. There are sunspots. How could Kepler, in an analogous situation, distinguish a transiting planet from star spots? Well, the answer actually is time scale. Venus will cross the surface of the sun in about seven hours. The sun would take 30 days to rotate. So the variability of the sun from sunspots will have a different characteristic time scale than this eight-hour variability from the transit of Venus. And it's one of many ways that one has to use very powerful statistics to pull out the real signal from transiting planets, from the noise, much of it simply due to the intrinsic variability of the star, whether it's star spots or oscillations or whatever, that we cannot control. And it turns out that actually the sun, which was the only star for which we could make these observations before, is a little quieter than the average. So we designed Kepler for a certain capability for a truly solar-type star. And these other stars are a little bit noisier. And that's one reason we're going into a five-year extension of the Kepler mission. So by extending the observation period, you improve the signal to noise and your ability to pull out planets. Nevertheless, Kepler has by now found roughly 3,000 planet candidates. It's extraordinary success. You'll note that there is an interesting gap here. There are these 3,000 planet candidates, and we think from the studies that have been made that 90 to 95 percent of those are real, and only about 5 percent are false positives. But it's very hard to prove that. And so only some 30 objects that have Kepler numbers like these, you know, Kepler 22 or whatever, are really solidly there, and the Kepler team has been studying. But the fact is you can start to do wonderful statistics with the whole set even if it's contaminated by a few false positives. Naturally, the, the main first objects observed were big, because the bigger the planet, the larger the drop in brightness when it crosses in front of the star. 
And then one gradually beats your way down to smaller ones, because you get repeated trances. And the signal to noise goes up as you add multiple trances. In addition, we really would like to find planets in the habitable zone. And what's the habitable zone for a solar-type star? It's planets like Earth or Venus, which have periods of nearly a year. And it takes three transit observations to be sure of a detection. So it takes three years of observing before you can start to get objects in the habitable zone of a solar-type star. Nevertheless, it's happening. <coughs> you will note, if you look at the, uh, the news reports, that it's kind of variable. I don't know how many times they've announced one of the smallest planets so far, of an Earth-sized planet when it really was twice the size of the Earth, of a habitable zone planet. Yeah, there are quite a few of those, but they're the habitable zone of, of faint M-type stars rather than Earth-sized. I don't think we've quite, quite reached Earth 2.0. Jill can correct me if I'm wrong. A true analog of Earth, an object the size of the Earth in the habitable zone of a sun solar type star, but we will soon have dozens of them. Here, though, is some cool results so far, sizes of planet candidates. There are some larger than Jupiter, even. We don't know anything about those. We don't have them in our own solar system. There are 210 Jupiter-sized objects. There are more than 1,000 Neptune or Uranus-size. 676 super-Earths. We have no real idea of what they would be like in our own solar system. There's a sharp demarcation in mass and size between terrestrial planets and giant planets. These fit in between. Whether they could be habitable is a major question in astrobiology. And then already 246 Earth size. Now the detection is highly biased toward large objects. So when you see small ones, the Earth size ones coming up, you begin to realize those are in fact the most common planets out there. Who would have thunk it that we actually are finding Earths and they are common? in the universe. It is one of the most spectacular results in my lifetime in science. And we begin now to see planetary systems, not single planets, but multiple planets. And since they influence each other gravitationally, it gives us another powerful tool for looking at the masses and nature of those individual planets. Now just a few other things. Uh, there's multiple asteroid systems. This involves ground-based observations with the biggest telescopes in the world, like the Keck telescopes in Hawaii. And again, we are finding multiple objects. And whenever you find a double or triple system or a satellite, it greatly improves your ability to find the physical properties, and particularly the mass and density, and begin to understand what, what these asteroids really are like. Um, everybody, I'm sure, has seen Information on the Suttersville meteorite, which happened just a month ago, and uh, was a bright daylight fireball coming in from Nevada, across the Sierra Nevada, into the Central Valley, and exploded, producing what's called a meteorite shower. And probably hundreds of kilograms of fragments came down. But mostly they came down in the Sierra Nevada in the woods and the fields and will never be found. But Peter Jenniskens has found some. He was not the first person there. The first person to find one was a meteorite collector and salesperson from Tucson who drove straight up 15 or 16 hours without a break from Tucson to get here and find the first one. Peter got the second one. Those are especially important because Shortly after that, it rained. And this turns out to be a very rare, very interesting meteorite with lots of organic material in it. In fact, terrestrial microbes love to eat it. Water can soak into it. And so by now, there are 30-some samples that have been found. But the most important remain the early ones. And there are probably still tens of thousands of samples out there that we'll never recover. But our analytic techniques are so good that even with a 
fraction of a gram, you can do tremendous analysis of an object like this. Now, let me conclude by saying that most people in this room may live to see the success of this ultimate quest for finding life beyond the Earth. There are three ways that we could do it. First, the habitable worlds in our solar system, especially Mars. The next generation of Mars missions may include life detection experiments, or maybe we'll have Mars sample return. There is a reasonable chance within the next couple of decades that we will have explored Mars to a level of detail that we will figure out with some confidence that there may be life there. The Kepler worlds are a vast new possibility. But remember, the Kepler worlds now are only seen by their ability to block the light of their stars. They are not seen at all. It will take a new generation of telescopes to detect those objects, to detect the light reflected from them, and look for biosignatures in the atmospheric chemistry of those worlds. And I'm sure that will be an area of great dispute. There will be evidence and there will be people who will argue, well, yes, there's some oxygen there, but it could have a different origin. It isn't necessarily evidence of life. And of course, going with that is the fact that the Earth didn't have oxygen for its first couple billion years, and yet we did have life. It's not going to be simple, but there's going to be a big push in the astronomical community to look for evidence of life on distant worlds like those being discovered by Kepler. And finally, there is SETI, which gets better and better every year. The capabilities grow with Moore's Law. It could succeed at any time, and no one can predict when it will succeed or if it will succeed. But given the tremendous rate at which the capability increases, again, you can say within the next generation, there's some reasonable chance. Seth Shostak has stuck his neck out and predicted in, the, in 25 years that we'll succeed. Which will succeed first? Where do you want to put your, uh, your bets? Are we going to find life in our own solar system? Are we going to find evidence of life elsewhere that's altered the atmospheric chemistry of distant planets? Are we going to find signals from an intelligent society? There could not be a more wonderful time to be alive when all three of those are active possibilities. To return to a theme I said before, we do this work because it's good science, because it's exciting, and because it allows us to interact with the public and students and perhaps improve the scientific literacy of the population. We do a lot of educational work here. We're just this year preparing for these amazingly bright undergraduate students who come every summer to do research with our scientists. Um, we also have a couple of things that you probably know about. This is the commercials for Big Picture Science. That's Shostak's uh, radio show. It is now broadcast on more than 60 radio stations, 100,000 podcast downloads a month. If you haven't heard it, do. It's a cool, cool show. It's not just about SETI activities by any means, but about the excitement of modern science. And then finally, there's SETICON 2, which again is for all of you. It's for everybody. It's a way of providing outreach to the community, of inspiring kids, of helping make sure there is a next generation of scientists to carry on and improve upon the work we're doing now. Thank you. Uh, Dave, I'm going to kick off with the obvious question. Which of those three uh, methods of finding life do you think uh, will pay off first? I truly don't know. All I can say is I'd really love to be alive for one of them to work. <laughs> and almost everybody here is a good deal younger than I am. So uh, you have a good chance. Let me say one more thing uh, uh, that I would prefer not to try to answer questions about our Astrobiology Institute proposal. 
I went over it very quickly. It is still pending. It is still being reviewed. And so there's a certain proprietary nature to it, and it's probably better not to go into detail. I have so many questions, but one, the planetary stewardship point rather negates the possibility of sending humans to Mars. And also, what do you think the odds are for life actually existing on Europa? Yes, if you really take it literally, you could not send humans to Mars without contaminating the planet. And so many people would say we need to do a really thorough robotic exploration first. But in practical terms, I think the most likely scenario for humans to Mars is that they'll fly uh, and set up a base on one of the Martian satellites and teleoperate things on the surface, which is a great compromise between strictly robotic and human exploration. Um, the, you ask then the question, what level of certainty would you have to have that there is not life on Mars or that there is life and you understand it enough that it will be immune to contamination from Earth that you can send the people? It's a very, very tricky question. And what was your other one? Life on Europa. Oh, I have no idea. Uh, the energy source is somewhat problematic. The availability of organic chemistry is somewhat problematic, even though there is plenty of water and there could be the analog of the deep sea vents, which support biology on Earth. I think probably with both Mars and Europa, terrestrial-like microbes could live there. But do they? Did life originate there? In the case of Mars, it's ambiguous because Mars and Earth have exchanged meteorites. And it's quite possible that one transferred life to the other. What makes Europa so wonderfully exciting is it is truly isolated. It sits there in the deep gravity well of Jupiter. It doesn't exchange material with anybody. If there is life on Europa, it will be N equals 2. It will be evidence of a second genesis. But it's going to be awfully hard to find it. David, that was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, you said only one thing with which I would take any issue, and I thought it was worth commenting on, and that is you characterized uh, looking for water as an indicator of possible habitability, particularly on exosolar planets, as looking for life as we know it. And I would argue that it's not, that life can be very, very different than life as we know it and still use water as a solvent. Water is, after all, the combination of the first and third most abundant elements in the universe. If life is common in the universe, water is going to be common in the universe as well, and life of a wide, wide range of chemistries could still use water. The other thing is you said, well, we don't know how to look for life as we don't know it. And I think, in fact, there's an approach to that, which is to look for life's effects on its environment. We can, and we have been learning how to distinguish physical and chemical changes in the environment from biological changes in the environment. The changes in the environment might be similar, even though the life that's causing those changes is very, very different. I'm happy to agree with both of those statements, and thank you. Oh, hi. Um, I'm looking forward to, to realizing what we discovered, Earth 2.0, but you, know, you look at our planet and then you start comparing it to all the planets that we're discovering. To, you know, it'd be nice to have a thinner atmosphere, I mean a thicker atmosphere, or more land mass, or a uh, more Mediterranean zone. Uh, perhaps the more ideal planet is not like an Earth, but something a little bit bigger. That's an excellent point, and I think that, uh, that we have to realize that our opinions and our understanding has been traditionally dominated by our own solar system. And when people began to look for extrasolar planets, they thought, oh, it'll be just like ours. There'll be some giant planets out here, there'll be some terrestrial planets there. Nope. We have not yet found an analog of our solar system. We find amazingly different objects. And when you think of the Tatooine type of thing with double stars and planets going around them, it's a wonderfully complex world out there. And maybe super-Earths are a better place.
Thank you again. Uh, I'd like to ask you, is there any consensus or agreement, at least at a concept level, of what just constitutes life? No. So how do you know really what <laughs> you'd be looking for? No, and that is a wonderful question to which I don't think there's a satisfactory answer. I have been told there are close to 50 different definitions of life floating around. A definition often used by NASA is wonderfully impractical, and that is that life is, an, is a, a, a system that undergoes Darwinian evolution, in which case we would not be able to determine that any of you was alive or anything else unless you waited for tens of thousands of years to see what would happen, and then the system, would, that would be a property of an ecosystem, not of an individual. Um, but one could have a whole great talk here on the definition of life. What people fall back on is really rather unsatisfactory. It's, well, I can't define it, but I'd know it if I saw it. Um, what about non-carbon-based life in the universe? Well, I will we'll go back to, uh, to what, what Carl Pilcher said. Uh, water is extremely common, most common thing we know of other than the gases of hydrogen and helium. Carbon is extremely common. Carbon and water go together. Carbon produces these complex molecules. They're not just complex in their total number of elements, but in the, the shapes they take, the way they're able to control reproduction through the complexity of the kind of carbon molecules you can get. So if you think life is likely to use water, it follows it's going to be likely to use carbon, and I don't have much hope for silicon life unless, by silicon life you mean artificial life, computer life, silicon chip life. That is another subject for a wonderful different talk. Dave, I wonder for those um, <coughs> humans uh, watching this talk on YouTube in a thousand years, they may think of our use of the word life a lot like you are thinking of the European geologist's word, uh, paleoprozoic, you know, somewhat uh, dated and um, in needing of uh, some, uh, some changes in the interim. Let's hope that's true. <laughs> and so I don't mean hope that they're watching this talk in a thousand <laughs> years, but that our understanding of life will have advanced far beyond anything we can imagine. And of course, we understand that they'll be uh, absorbing uh, these talks in the future by uh, swallowing pills uh, like they do in the Matrix. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Dave for his great talk. Thank you.